Let's begin our case study. The patient is a 36-year-old female. She complains of fatigue. She actually wakes up tired. She describes an overall joint achiness. She has a stressful job as an occupational therapist. Describes minimal exercise, mostly one to two mile walks, maybe twice a week. And she describes a diet of moderate protein intake and avoids sugar. The NutraVal results overview is our first opportunity to use pattern analysis. So when I look at the antioxidants, B vitamins and minerals, I wanna know what are the headlines here? Antioxidants, well, there is a moderate need for alpha lipoic acid. B vitamins, I think that's a strong headline. The B6, certainly the folic acid and the B12, which also make me think about methylation, key players in methylation detoxification, as is magnesium. When we look at the supplement schedule, in addition to the various needs on the overview page that we just looked at, we also see some moderate recommendations for omega-3 and pancreatic enzyme support. The omega-3, 1,000 milligrams. Look at the pancreatic enzyme in yellow, a moderate need for pancreatic enzymes at 5,000 IU per meal. The Krebs cycle shows no significant imbalances. The fatty acid oxidation looks unremarkable based on a very normal subaric and adipic acid finding. Glycolysis, the creation or conversion of carbohydrates into peruvic acid and lactic acid, are well within the range. And there are no ketone body findings outside of the reference range as far as the beta-hydroxybutyric acid. When the beta-hydroxybutyric acid is high, then you have to ask the question, why high ketone bodies? You see this in starvation diets, diabetes, uh, alcoholism. You'll see this also in the ketogenic diet. Low-carb diets do create ketones. The organic acids page, or the metabolic analysis markers page, is divided into various functional categories. We start with malabsorption and dysbiosis markers. These all look really very good inside the reference range. This is the section that is often responsible for probiotic recommendations. The cellular energy and mitochondrial metabolites are those organic acids we've already looked at as part of the Krebs cycle pathway chart. Note the creatinine concentration at the bottom left is well within the reference range, so we have a good specimen. We spoke earlier about the various pathways involved in the neurotransmitter metabolites. I would point out, though, that tryptophan does make kynurinic acid in stressful situations like high cortisol or inflammation. But the key is, does kynurinic acid convert into quinolinic acid here at 3.4? Quinolinic acid is a known neurotoxin, and it's excitatory to the central nervous system and is associated with systemic inflammation. That's why we look at the kynurinic quinolinic ratio. If it's a low ratio shifted to the left into the red, that means we're making more quinolinic acid, and that's problematic and tells us that we have to look at inflammation as a key take-home point. These are the vitamin markers. We're going to look at this again on the next slide because we do have an elevation here. Toxin and detoxification markers look just fine. The alpha-ketophenolacidic from styrene and the alpha-hydroxyisobutyric acid from MTBE tell us that at this point, not any high exposure to those two water-soluble toxins. I mentioned on the previous page that under vitamin markers, we had an elevation. Here it is, the faminoglutamic acid, or FIGLU. You can see it's at 1.8. This is a great illustration of what we mean by a functional recommendation. Faminoglutamic acid comes from L-histidine, which is an amino acid. So the conversion of L-histidine to FIGLU, and then the breakdown of FIGLU via the cofactor of folate. But if folate functionally is inadequate, then we'll have a buildup of FIGLU, which will lead to greater urinary excretion. So a high finding in the urine for faminoglutamic acid tells us that there's a functional need for folate. Let's take a look at the amino acids page, in this case from a plasma amino acids finding. On the left, we see the nutritionally essential amino acids. 
The first thing I want to look for is a pattern. What is the pattern of the nutritionally essential amino acids? Drawing this plumb line tells me that for the most part, we're to the left of the midpoint. So a little bit on the lower moderate section in terms of nutritionally essential amino acids from the diet. How does that compare to the non-essential protein amino acids? Well, I would say the non-essentials are even lower than that. So there may well be a conversion issue. The nutritionally essential amino acids may need nutrient cofactors, B vitamins and nutrients, to better convert into the non-essential protein amino acids. In addition, I want to get a sense of the dietary intake of protein. Does it match up with this less than moderate essential pattern? And when I look at the 1-methylhistidine, I see that it doesn't. 1-methylhistidine is elevated here. That tells me that the patient is likely eating a pretty high protein diet. I know the protein diet that she described was more moderate, but we see evidence here from fish, fowl, or meat that it's higher than that. And yet the essential amino acids pattern does not reflect a high dietary intake of protein. The algorithm will look at this and make a recommendation, a moderate recommendation for pancreatic enzyme support. We look at the amino acids plasma and continue with the intermediary metabolites, the B vitamin markers, which look fine, the urea cycle markers that look good as well. I always keep an eye on the urea here at 497 because a high protein diet should move the urea to a higher level, shifting it to the right. The glycine and serine metabolites also look within the reference range. Now we can look at the essential and metabolic fatty acid markers. And we start off with the omega-3s. And we can see that there's a low omega-3 index at the bottom right at 4.4. Remember, that comes from the top left, from the sum of the EPA, 0.37, and the DHA, 4.1. So that 4.4 finding speaks to a low omega-3 index and a need for omega-3 supplementation. We also see in the omega-6 fatty acids a low DGLA. So that's also a pro-inflammatory finding. Low omega-3s, low omega-6 DGLA. Here's the pathway chart we looked at earlier. Remember, there was a low GLA, so there's little to convert from the gamma-linolenic into the dihomogamma-linolenic. So I would consider GLA supplementation. And you see it in the second box. Evening Primrose, Barrage, Black Current all have GLA to convert into DGLA. The arachidonic acid is really the pro-inflammatory finding when elevated. A high arachidonic acid creates a cascade of inflammation, but this moderate finding is just fine. So the bottom line here is we need more conversion of GLA into DGLA which means also more GLA. As a result of the low delta-6 desaturase conversion of linoleic to gamma-linolenic, I would also think about the nutrient cofactor findings listed on the center of the page under delta-6 desaturase. The oxidative stress markers look just fine. The glutathione, the lipid peroxides, and 8-OHDG, remember those two, are measurable oxidative stress damage when in the yellow or red. And the CoQ10 is moderate, so really nothing here uh, that speaks to supplementation needs. These are the elemental markers from blood. On the left, we have the nutrient elements. So you see copper through zinc listed here. Notice the magnesium is actually a little bit low at 31.6. You may recall that there was a moderate recommendation for magnesium on the front two pages. On the right side of the page, we see the toxic elements. These are all from the uh, whole blood measure. And we can see here the mercury exposure at 8.69 is rather high. Typically, we see this in patients that eat a lot of seafood. Also, sometimes, if you have a fish oil supplement that is not really of the best quality, we'll often see an elevation of mercury as well. So one key thing here to do is find out what's the source of that mercury. Since it's measured in whole blood, whatever the exposure was, it occurred 120 days from the time of the blood draw. After reviewing the findings of the NutriVal, here are treatment recommendations to consider. For her inflammation, support with omega-3 and GLA omega-6 fatty acid supplementation. Follow up with an adrenal cortex stress profile 
to assess the HPA axis imbalance that we see. Remember, she complains of waking up tired and being fatigued throughout the day. The adrenal cortex stress profile also has the option of a cortisol awakening response, and that would be a great pairing as well. So adrenal cortex stress profile and CAR. Support better sleep. Consider phosphatidylserine three hours before bedtime. For oxidative stress and detoxification, alpha-lipoic acid support is indicated. B vitamin support is indicated with a methylated folate to support methylation. Supplement magnesium is indicated on the test as well. Remember, there were digestion questions around pancreatic enzyme support needs. So pancreatic enzymes possibly even betaine hydrochloride. Consider evaluating the GI tract with GI effects stool profiles like the GI effects 2200. And for diet, consider a Mediterranean style diet for better balance. Find the source of the elevated mercury as well. Thanks for listening. I'm Stephen Goldman, a medical education specialist at Genova, and I'll see you on the phone.